but we rebuilt, so by 1753, this would be the second Capitol building on this site, and then in 1780, everything moves to Richmond. So, with that move, the building is empty. It's used for a while as uh, barracks and storage, but after the war, it's taken over by the College of William and Mary's law professors who use it as uh, offices and classrooms and hold mock trials until about 1832, and guess what happens? Another fire breaks out. Parson destroys the building, and they demolish the rest of it as being unsafe. Shortly after that, the railroad comes to Williamsburg, and in their infinite wisdom, the tracks run right up the middle of Duke Gloucester Street, right through where we're standing right now. So, even if they wanted to rebuild here, they get trains in the way. So, not much is going to stand on this site until about 1898, when the property is acquired by the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, who does some preliminary excavations here, uncovers the original foundations, and puts up a monument commemorating the building. That's going to be here until 1928 when they donate it to us and we complete the excavations, find really good foundations, and start rebuilding the third Capitol building here in 1931. We finish it in 1934, and guess what happens to it? It stays. We are going into it right now, so come on in with me. Well done, Mr. Tilly. Well done. Ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to have a seat on either side. Make yourselves comfortable. Left or right doesn't matter. We're all going to have Switzerland, 
They've all been reading John Locke, David Hume, more importantly, Adam Smith has just published his book, The Wealth of Nations. Tom Paine just put out a little pamphlet he calls Common Sense. Old political philosophies, new political philosophies coming together. These men are affected by them. So much so that in their minds, what we are embarking on right now is not just a political revolution to change the government. In their minds, this is a social revolution as well. A chance to change not just the government, but the society within that government. To do this, we're going to rethink everything we know. We're throwing out the last 2,000 years. We are taking as our model for this new government the Roman Republic. Get rid of the idea that a king, an individual, is the sovereign head of the state. Instead, in this republic, the people are the head of the state, and the government answers to the people. Sound good? Absolutely. Who are the people? We are. Specifically, white men over the age of 21 who are Protestant property owners. Who feels represented right now? <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Okay, we'll have to fix that at some point. But we need something in place. We need a constitution, but first we need to define the limitations of our government. We need to define your individual rights as Virginians, the things that the government must protect and cannot take away from you. To get this down, we are going to put it into a document that we're going to unimaginatively call a Declaration of the Rights of the People of Virginia. To get that document written, however, we're going to have to do what all good governments do and form a committee. How many of you have been on a committee? So you know how smoothly it's going to go. <laughs> Make it even more difficult, 36 men are appointed to this committee to draft the Declaration of Rights. When you came in, I'm sure you noticed that the building of the ring has two distinct sides to it, connected by a walkway upstairs called the Joint Committee or Joint Conference Room. That is the only room in the building large enough to contain these men and their egos. So let's head on up and see what they came up with. <laughs> Absolutely. Here in the 18th century, we call ribbon tape. We are all tied up with red tape. <laughs> all documents that come to the government are tied up and bundled up with red tape. So to get anything done, you have to cut through the red tape and get to the documents. With that in mind, let's head on into the committee room. Take a few out, condense, combine, 
At the end of it all, they come up with a document containing 16 articles defining your rights as Virginians. Things that I think you're going to find pretty familiar even today, starting with Article 1. Tell me if you have heard this anywhere before. Article 1 states that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights, of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity. Namely, the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Where have you heard that before? All right. Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson steals this, rewrites it in ten times as many words, because that's what he does. <laughs> that's all right, Mason's taking this right out of John Locke. It's making the rounds. But this, this first article, this is our underlying philosophy and principle. This idea that no one man is inherently better than another man. The king of England is no better than the farmer down the street. How's that for a radical idea? And we're not stopping there. Brace yourselves. <laughs> Article 4 states that no man or set of men are entitled to exclusive or separate emoluments or privileges from the community, except in consideration of public service. This not being descendable, the offices of magistrate, legislator, and judge are not to be hereditary. And with that, we just got rid of the House of Lords. And we're to the idea that there's a ruling aristocracy. No laws will be passed over you, judgments made on you by someone simply by benefit of the family we've been born into. Those two articles, we've just turned everything we know about government on its ear. Now we can get into the nitty gritty of it, like uh, Article 9. Excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. It should. We stole it, word for word, from the English Bill of Rights. 1688. The glorious revolution in Great Britain puts that man, William of Orange, on the throne, along with his wife, Mary. In fact, he gives us the name of the city that we're currently in, and they both give us the name of the college at the end of the street. But one of the provisions of Parliament giving them the throne is that they be allowed to draft a Bill of Rights. Article 9 of our Declaration of Rights, word for word, right out of that document. Most of our jurisprudence ideas are coming from that document. Your right to a speedy trial, trial by a jury, freedom from self-incrimination. All of these ideas out of the English Bill of Rights, right into ours, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So we're keeping the old ideas at work and we're throwing some new ones in, and the one that I think gets the most debate and discussion is the last one. Article 16 states that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. Why do you suppose that article should get so much debate? Any ideas? <laughs> The Church of England told everybody what they had to believe. And the Church of England is the official state church of Virginia. The royal governor is the head of the church. The law in Virginia requires you to attend services once a month. If you fail to do so, you're fined five shillings. The law further requires you to pay an annual tithe to the church for the support of the widows, the orphans, and the poor. That's part of the reason. The bigger reason, though, is nobody thinks it's a necessary article. We consider ourselves to be one of the most tolerant colonies in North America. In fact, as far as we're concerned, as long as you follow the law, we really don't care what you are. If you want to be a Baptist, you go right ahead. Go down to the courthouse, register yourself as a dissenter, everything's fine. Methodist, no problem. Presbyterian, Quaker, Mohammedan, Hindu, Jew, as long as you're not Catholic, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Being Catholic is treason, right? <laughs> well, who's the Catholic's first allegiance to? The Pope. The Pope is the head of a foreign state. That's treason by definition. But we're not knocking on your door to ask you, so keep your head down, go to Maryland, nobody cares. Why do we need an article in our Declaration of Rights guaranteeing you free exercise of religion if we don't care what you are? The answer is, from James Madison, this doesn't even go far enough. What is religious toleration? How long does it last? Until we decide it doesn't last, right? There's nothing to say that in 20 years we're not going to blame all of our problems on the Methodists and get rid of them. Nothing to say that we're not going to get a bunch of Presbyterians coming into Virginia building meeting houses all over the place. Well, the government needs more money. Let's put a special tax on Presbyterian meeting houses. This article is necessary to prevent that from ever happening. And that is the argument that wins the day. June the 12th, 1776, lightning strikes again downstairs, unanimously ratified. Constitution is written, it takes all the power of the royal governor, gives it to the elected representatives. In fact, we gut the office of royal government completely. By the time we're done with it, all the governor can do is appoint minor government officials and make treaties. 
We had a second legislative branch, the Senate chamber upstairs. So if the delegates downstairs and the senators upstairs agree, it goes into law, the governor never reads it. June 29th, that constitution is ratified, Patrick Henry becomes our governor, and almost a full week before they vote on independence in Philadelphia, we have broken with the crown, drafted a declaration of rights, ratified the constitution, and elected a governor. We've got government. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong now, right? It breaks down immediately, starting with the courts. Come with me, let's go down to the general courts, see what they do there. So it becomes a big problem when it doesn't do what it should. But as we know, have a look in the room over here on the left. This is the governor's council chamber. The royal governor meets here with 12 advisors appointed by the king to help him run the colony. Those 13 men are the judges for the high court downstairs. And once you've had a chance to see the governor's council room, we'll mosey on down. Time for your trial. 
This trial is going to look a lot like they do today with a couple minor differences. First thing we're going to do is